G'day teachers and welcome to what is going to be one of the most exciting webinars I think we've ever done, which is all about the Microsoft Translator app. It is an amazing tool that can be used for EAL students, um, deaf and hard of hearing students um, and other students as well. It's really quite exciting. I've got Will Lewis, who is the principal PM architect from Microsoft in Seattle. He's coming in today to tell us all about the awesomeness of the translator and how it can be used in your classroom. I've also got a panel of teachers that we're going to bring in who are going to be asking questions. And don't forget, if you're on a live webinar right now, there's also a live Q&A available to you to fire your questions through as well. So let's get to it, hey? Sure. Uh, my name is uh, uh, William Lewis. Uh, I'm a principal PM architect on the Microsoft Translator team uh, here in Seattle, Washington. Uh, and Microsoft Translator is a product that allows you to translate between languages. Uh, it's aptly named for that uh, for that reason. Uh, and I've been with the team uh, since its beginning uh, about 13 years ago. I started when we were just releasing it as a product. Uh, its focus then was on uh, translating text, uh, so like documents and that kind of thing between languages. We had a very small set of languages at that time, uh, I think eight languages when we started. Uh, and we now support over 70 languages and that list continues to grow. Um, the main focus uh, of Translator now is not just the text translation, which is what we traditionally have done, but also speech translation. So you can talk into an app, let's say, and have it uh, not only transcribe what it is that you're saying, but also translate what, what it is you're saying. And this is something we started working on uh, about six years ago, it's a little over six years ago, uh, it was kind of a, a what I call a skunk works project. It was something uh, that we were working on in secret uh, uh, for integration into Skype initially. So we called it Skype Translator and that came out uh, uh, just about six years ago. Uh, and then uh, integration into other products as well. So you'll see some of the end results of some of that work of the development of uh, this uh, speech translation uh, facility. So uh, when I'm giving a talk, generally I like to jump right in and start using the technology. So uh, the uh, next slide actually shows you how to join the session. And right now you don't have a session ID. So you can join using the Microsoft Translator app if you have that on your device. You can also join using the browser, so you can go to this website and join. So let me actually show you how to do this. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna activate a session. I'll walk through how to start your own session uh, a little later in this talk, but I've started a session that's captioning what I'm saying. And so right now you'll see uh, the captions of what I'm saying showing up on the screen. And this session is something that you can join from your own device. So you'll see this uh, uh, conversation code up here at the top. You'll see a QR uh, code as well. You can join from your mobile device using uh, that QR code or typing in this code here. So you can go to this website. If you type this into your browser, it doesn't matter what the browser is, it will actually start to show the captions on your local device. You can also scan this using the Microsoft Translator app. What will happen is you'll see the captions of what I'm saying on your device in the language you choose. So the, the, what's interesting about this is it doesn't have to just be English. You can see the captions of what's being talked about in your uh, respective language. So that's particularly useful in, edu in education because oftentimes we have students uh, who are recent uh, immigrants to the country who may not uh, know the language and need help uh, with accessing content in their native language. Likewise, parents, and this is something that's oftentimes overlooked. Parents oftentimes uh, struggle with this and oftentimes struggle with it a lot more uh, than students do. Um, I'm going to, uh, just to give you an idea of how, how this works, I'm going to join on my phone as well. So I'm going to, uh, I'm using the Microsoft Translator app on my phone. I'm going to scan this code. Just to give you a sense of, of the kind of interactions you can have. And so I'm joining on my phone. And uh, this same session, you'll see that I will phone joined there. Uh, so Adrian and I are in the call right now. And what I'm seeing on my phone is not only the English transcripts, I'm also seeing them in Russian. So I joined in the Russian language as well. So I'm seeing uh, captions of what's being talked about in 
a different language. So maybe I'm a Russian speaker and I can then uh, get captions of what's being talked about in Russian. Now to make the demo even more interesting, it could be interactive. So I don't have someone who speaks another language. I speak a little bit of Russian, so I'm gonna switch. I'm gonna turn this off right now. So just so while I'm speaking Russian, it doesn't try to caption my English. And so what you saw there was uh, me speaking in Russian, but when you look in the screen, you'll see that it translated it into the language that I have joined the session in. So I'm getting the translations in English here as an English speaker. The Russian speaker, of course, is getting them in Russian. If someone else joins in another language, they'll get it in their respective language. So you can have these kind of multilingual conversations uh, simultaneously. You can talk to a, not just one parent, but you can talk to multiple parents at the same time. Uh, irrespective of the languages that they speak. So uh, on this screen, you see uh, instructions more or less illustrated about how to join a session. Uh, and this right here is the multi-user uh, mode in the Translator app that you wanna select. And then you can either join a session or start your own. Uh, right now we're joining the session that I had started. So all of uh, my guests here are actually joining that session, but you could easily start your own. That's what I did. I created a session myself and then you're joining that session. So you create the session and then people can join that. And then you uh, have the session ID, uh, you specify your name and then the language that you want to view uh, the uh, captions or the, the transcripts in. Um, uh, there's a video on how to do this uh, that describes it in, in good detail, and this video link is right here. I'm going to move to the next page. If you're joining a, not from the Translator app, but from uh, your browser, you'll get a window that looks something like this, where you navigate to this URL, you enter the uh, conversation code, and then you specify your uh, name and language and then you enter the conversation. So you'll see uh, something very similar to what I showed on the screen when, uh, when I was showing the captions. And uh, this has gotten a lot of use uh, within education. Um, uh, and these are uh, images from schools uh, around the world, in fact, uh, that are using Microsoft Translator for various kinds of engagements. Now, I don't want to downplay uh, the accessibility uses of this. Uh, it is uh, This is used not just for multilingual communication, but also for uh, uh, folks who are uh, deaf and hard of hearing. A good example is right here. This is at a university where there's a large population of deaf students. Uh, the professor will teach uh, in English and the students will see captions on their screens in English. Um, but you also see an example here. This is in India. There's a, uh, this is a school that teaches primarily in English, uh, but the, the uh, parents, a number of the parents are from the region and they don't speak English particularly well. And so they're able to get captions in Tamil and Telugu as an example. So they can come to sessions provided by the school that are conducted in English and then see the captions in their native languages. Um, and then this school here, a uh, good example here is this student, uh, I believe, uh, speaks French and she doesn't understand English particularly well. So she is using her laptop with a headset and actually listening to the French audio from the transcripts. So the, the teacher here is speaking in English. The student is seeing French transcripts and hearing the French. Uh, and then this example up here in the upper right is uh, a teacher who is communicating with a parent who speaks Spanish and they're communicating the, 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 uh, the, uh, the parent is using a mobile device, the teacher is using her laptop. So a one-on-one -on -one kind of engagement here. And I'll talk about some of these scenarios in more detail. There's a lot of detail on this site. If you go to this Translator EDU site that has a lot of information about how to use Translator in various kinds of uh, education scenarios. So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail, uh, give some more background. And then what I'll do is after I give some more background on this, I'll actually walk through how to start a session. So we'll, we'll start a session from scratch. So you can see the steps I go through to actually create a session that, we, that you, uh, so you could follow the same thing in your classroom, start a session, and then have uh, students join that session. So uh, the underlying tech, uh, 
I, I mentioned speech translation. So speech translation uh, uh, more or less takes the speech signal, so like what I'm doing right now, and generating transcripts from that signal. So it runs through what's called automatic speech recognition to generate transcribed output. Now, what tends to happen is that we don't talk very fluently. When we talk, a lot of times there are pauses and pause words and we repeat words and stuff like that. Uh, that's actually difficult to read in transcripts. So we run an AI over that that removes some of the disfluent content that's in the output. When that's removed, it's easier to read for someone who reads uh, whatever the native language is, in this case, English. But it's also easier to translate. So one of the reasons we did this is to support both uh, deaf and hard of hearing users to provide them better captions and also uh, uh, users that speak other languages so they can provide better translations for them. We do partial translations and final translations. I won't go into all the details here, uh, but you'll probably notice sometimes that when a translation is happening, you'll see the words translate. And then when the sentence is done, it will kind of solidify into a better translation. So having the entire context, the translation seems uh, tends to be better. Uh, and then finally, uh, at the end, if the user chooses, they can turn on the audio and listen to it in their own language. And these are the number of languages we currently support for each of these. Uh, this number here is actually uh, relatively small and that's going to increase rather dramatically in the next, uh, uh, next couple of months uh, as we bring a, a bunch more languages online. Uh, and this is kind of uh, how it plays out in the school scenario. Uh, you have a student here who actually is uh, is hard of hearing. Uh, he has uh, cochlear implants and he sits in a class and is able to watch the transcripts of what the teacher is saying and participate then more fully in the class. Now he has some hearing ability because he is wearing the implant, uh, but uh, implants tend to drop off after about five, uh, like a, a one or two meters um, and uh, that makes it difficult for him to hear someone who might be across the room. The, the transcripts then give him the ability then to kind of, uh, if he misses anything, to go back and look. And you'll notice like with this student, when I would uh, watch him, uh, he would most of the time be looking at the teacher or other students in the class, but sometimes he'd get like a quizzical look on his face and then look over the transcript, sometimes scroll back because it was clear that he had missed something. And so this kind of fills in the blanks for him. Uh, and this is kind of step-by-step -step instruction on how to do this. I'll walk through this in more detail, uh, but more or less the teacher uh, uh, wears a mic. I recommend that. Uh, so this is a, a mic that she's wearing. It's very similar to the mic that I'm wearing right now. Uh, and that mic then is connected. Uh, this one is connected via Bluetooth uh, to the computer uh, that she is using to, uh, to uh, create the caption stream. And then that caption stream is then transmitted over Wi-Fi or wire connections uh, to the various devices uh, in the room. And this is an example of the transcripts and more uh, closer up. Uh, the quality tends to be pretty good. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, towards the end of my presentation, I'll talk a little bit about the quality, how we can measure quality. Uh, it is not going to be perfect. Uh, there will be errors in the signal. Uh, there are actually a couple of errors in this screenshot, but generally you can eliminate a lot of those errors if you're wearing a, a reasonably good quality mic. Uh, one of the reasons we recommend mics is, um, uh, number one, it brings the mic closer to your mouth, so it tends to do better when you're close talking. Uh, but also, if you're wearing a mic, uh, it tends to filter out some of the ambient noise in the environment. Uh, what tends to uh, reduce the quality of speech recognition is if there's a lot of noise. So if you have a lot of students shouting and there's a lot of ambient noise, if you're using the microphone on the laptop, uh, it will tend to pick up all of that noise. And so they will try to transcribe that noise, then you'll just get random stuff that will show up in the transcripts. If you wear a mic, especially one that's somewhat directional, it filters out all of that additional noise and it's just more or less getting the speaker. So um, we can, see this being used in, in a number of scenarios. Uh, I talked about it in the classroom scenario, and but it's also, I think, useful in engagements with parents. And I want to stress that that's actually, I think, one of the more powerful uses of this technology. Uh, students uh, who have immigrated to a country within, you know, depending on their age, within a, a few months to a year will probably ramp up to some ability in that language. Uh, 
but parents oftentimes are stranded. They oftentimes will either engage with uh, their community, the community of native speakers in their uh, in the environment, or uh, just have a much harder time learning the language. Uh, and so, what tends to happen with these parents is, in typical scenarios, they're not engaged in the child's education. And we know from a number of studies that if parents are involved in a child's education, that improves learning outcomes. So one of the ways we can involve parents who don't speak the native language is to provide them translations in their native language to at least give them background on what's being talked about. So there's this app. Whenever you speak, and it's breaking language barriers. You want to transfer an idea to another person. This is Chinook Middle School, and they're speaking with parents like never before. You've downloaded that Microsoft Translator app. Enable your phone to take a picture of this, this code, and then once you join, you're able to pick your language you'd like to have it speak. They're trying to break the multi-language barrier by holding a conversation together. In the bottom of our presentation, the translation just coming over in English. How does it work? The sound waves are picked up by the microphone. There was a question, and the library is open during tutorial. So these parents, speaking nine different languages, can hold one conversation together. They're using Microsoft AI technology, including a machine learning technique based on a form of computing called neural networks, inspired by human brains. Basically, it learns to translate based on real-world speech, not rules programmed in advance. That's Russell, the principal. He said he knows that, that engaging the parent community leads to better outcomes for our students. And at this school, they're using tools to bridge that communication gap. It brings voices from abroad and makes us neighbors of people. Have you ever felt a real need to do this? To communicate an idea to someone? Uh, this is another example of uh, the kinds of engagements. This is a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a parent, which might be more common, in fact. Um, and there, uh, uh, you can have, uh, like what, we're, what they show here is the teacher's talking on the laptop, the parent's on uh, her phone, and they're able to go back and forth. So the parent's speaking Spanish, the uh, educator is speaking in English. Uh, but it could also be done on a single device. Uh, so uh, I give you a couple of example videos here. One basically shows this kind of uh, two device uh, setup, but there's also uh, a good demo about uh, using just the mobile device. And, uh, so we have a recent update that we've made to the Microsoft uh, Translator apps. This is uh, just on iOS currently, but it will go to uh, Android, uh, I think within a month or two. Uh, and uh, you'll see in this picture where you have two people talking to each other and the app is on the table. And it's actually uh, in, in both directions and we have it set up so you don't have to push the buttons on the phone. You just set the phone down, you indicate the two languages that are being talked, and then it autom automatically recognizes which language is being spoken and then translates appropriately. Uh, this, there's a video here, uh, which I'll just go ahead and play uh, and you can kind of see how, how this works. So this is a video showing uh, the, the latest uh, auto feature that I just mentioned. Uh, and the way you start is you start by selecting the audio button, then you select the languages, select auto, and then it will automatically enable uh, the speaker, uh, the microphones whenever someone's talking. Now I paused here because there's this button here too, which is very interesting. What this does is it, uh, it inverts this side for the, the person on that side. So what you'll have is text that will be oriented towards the speaker on this side that will be on this side of the screen, and then text oriented the other direction for the speaker that's on this uh, that side of the screen. So that's actually, I think, very convenient uh, for these kinds of scenarios where you have two people talking and speaking uh, two different languages. It will automatically recognize the languages that are being spoken. Uh, that's currently available just for iOS right now, but that is going to be available on Android uh, soon. So a good example of this again is if you look at this image, uh, two people sitting at a table, 
uh, and they uh, they basically just turn on auto mode and then they can talk freely with one another. Uh, the captions will show on the screen, but it also plays the audio translation for each of the individuals, uh, for the two individuals. And then uh, coming back to the non-English speaking parents, I kind of keep uh, hitting on this topic, but I think it's it's important to recognize that there are a number of issues with doing this. And we've kind of, we've played through these scenarios uh, a lot with educators and we've come up with a number of solutions that make it work better. So let's suppose you have a meeting like this that's coming up. You have parents that are non-English speaking. You have a group of them that are coming. How in the world are you going to engage with them? Okay, I've shown you how you can use this tech, but there's still the problem of you're prepping for it, you're going to have these languages that are going to be represented. You know what the languages are, maybe in advance, but how do you tell them what to do? I mean, that part of the problem is that they have to join this. They have to figure out how to use their device to join the session in their language, but they don't understand English. So how do you tell them what to do? I mean, that's actually a really hard problem then, uh, especially if there are multiple languages being spoken. What we've done is we've created a set of uh, parent-teacher conference letters so this, these have been translated manually into over 70 languages, so supporting all of our main languages. And they're in Word, uh, Word documents that you can go in, they're written in each of the languages, and you can go in and put your information, like the, the school address, let's say, or uh, uh, you know uh, other information about the school where they're gonna need to attend, or maybe it will be online and you wanna provide uh, what they need to join. Maybe it's a Teams meeting, and you provide that connect, uh, connection information there, or what have you. Uh, that letter can be emailed to them or mailed to them or however you want to get it to them. And now uh, they're able to then, they'll have instructions in advance on how to use the Microsoft Translator app. So it will be instructions in their language about what to do when they show up, how to scan the QR code, how to key in the code, all of the stuff that I've showed you how to do, they'll have in their respective languages. So that's on, again, on the Translator uh, EDU site. So let's let's talk about this in more detail. I'm gonna show you how to actually start a session yourself. Um, so this is the multi-device conversation where you can have multiple people join in multiple languages. And what's nice is this, this Microsoft multi-device feature allows a variety of different devices. It can be uh, apps on the phone. Uh, it can be apps or browsers on tablets. So like on an iPad, for instance or laptops or any kind of co uh, computational device that has a browser. Uh, and then, uh, so these are the different apps that we support. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, I didn't, oh, I, uh, the, uh, it's, oh, there it is, okay. Uh, we also have, uh, OneNote is integrating this as well. Uh, this is currently in preview. I wanted to mention this and there's a video about this. Here I am in OneNote for the web and I'm gonna go to the view tab. And I'm the student in this case. So the student is in here and way over on the right here, there's a live captions button and I'll click that. The live captions pane opens. Now as the student, I'm gonna paste that join code my educator gave me and join the session. And I'm gonna choose a captions language. You'll see there are almost 70 languages in here and I'm gonna choose English to start and click join. But I could choose a different language and caption in that language. Now, what you're seeing on the right are captions coming through in real time. So if I'm a student, I can get these captions right here and I can take notes at the same time. So over here in OneNote, I can still say I am taking notes. Now, let's say the educator was saying something and I was like, wait, I, I forgot what they were saying. That was something important. In the upper right, I'll click pause. I can pause those captions in real time. So now I can go up here and maybe I want to highlight something. So I'm going to turn on the yellow highlighter and I'm going to go and I'm going to highlight something. That's yellow. That's important. Oh, this part is important here. And maybe I want to go and uh, change the colors to make a different color. And I can even make the text bigger. So if I drop down this right here, I can make the text a little bigger so I can see it. Now the educator's continuing to talk while I pause these captions. And a lot of students would worry that they're going to miss all that information. Well, if I hit resume, what you can see is everything that the professor or the educator was saying is captured right here. So that is really inclusive. Maybe that's something where there's too much information coming and I couldn't absorb it all. Now the other nice thing is that everything that I was saying is automatically captured. Look over here on the left, you're going to see a transcripts section that is automatically created. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the live captions pane 
And when I switch over to transcripts, you'll see everything that was being talked about was captured automatically and saved in my OneNote, the entire transcript. So you can see on the transcripts section, this page was automatically created and it has the join code, the transcript, the date. It even captures all the highlights that I made when it was over there in the captions pane. So all transcripts are automatically saved. And we know from research that having transcripts and live interactive captions helps improve student outcomes across the board inclusively. Now I'll briefly show using live captions using a different language. So again, on the view tab, way over on the right, I click live captions and I'll enter my join code. And this time I'm gonna choose a different language. There's all these different languages here. And the language that I choose in this case is going to be Japanese and I'll click join. Now you can see the Japanese characters coming through. And if I speak a different language than maybe the educator speaks, this is very easy for me to follow along. Maybe I'm sitting way back in the class or maybe I wanna make sure to capture everything for later. I can do the same as before and everything will go into the transcripts. So this is OneNote live captions. So uh, I wanna talk about a, a couple of other topics that I get questions about all the time. Uh, one is support for deaf and hard of hearing students or parents. Uh, we are uh, uh, actually used quite a bit in schools for this kind of scenario. We've been partnering with Phonak who makes uh, devices for deaf and hard of hearing uh, uh, people for, uh, primarily for transmitting audio. So like uh, uh, st students can have attachments to their hearing aids or their cochlear implants that will produce audio in their devices, but we can also capture that audio stream and caption it. So uh, this is an example Phonak device that a lot of educators use in the United States. Uh, and uh, this device uh, is, a, is basically a microphone that transmits audio directly to the student's hearing device, but also you can generate captions off, off of it. So what's nice about this, and there are instructions here on how to do that, uh, you can have uh, audio that's transmitted to the students, which is very helpful for them, and then also from the same device generate captions. Uh, other questions I get are about quality, and I want to talk about how we measure quality. And I think this is an important discussion to have uh, because we're looking at automated tools for uh, generating transcripts and captions. And you know, how good is it? How, how, what's the quality? What we found is uh, by measuring uh, people who uh, caption for a living versus our device, there are differences in quality. So uh, CART is the service that's used uh, in the United States. There are services around the world for this. This is an example of a caption device. Uh, so this is basically a person who's a stenographer, just like you would see in a courtroom, who uses this device to caption the audio uh, that's being uh, uh, said within that current environment. And then the caption stream shows up on the computer or other devices in the room. Uh, the a CART a captionist, uh, typically has an error rate, uh, so we measure the amount of error, uh, an error rate of around four to six percent. It's important to recognize that even a human is not at zero percent. Humans have error in their caption feed. When they are captioning, the best you can get is around four to six percent. Now what I'm saying there is important to recognize, that's the very best you can get. Generally it's higher than that. So when a, when a person's captioning, uh, the error rate can go up uh, if they're maybe less skilled or they don't hear the audio as well, or maybe they don't understand some of the vocabulary that's being talked about. Maybe it's some technical vocabulary and they just don't understand it. That increases the error rate. Um, our service gets an error rate. It varies uh, widely depending on a bunch of factors like the microphone, the amount of noise in the environment and such like that of around eight to 15%. Uh, we have uh, work that we've done in this space, and these numbers keep changing because we keep working on this, where we're, uh, you know, we've achieved through research projects a human parity level. So meaning that we have uh, caption uh, percentages or error rate percentages that are uh, competitive with human captioning. Uh, these tend to be slower, so they're not in production. Our production models are very fast. Uh, these have an error rate of around, uh, again, like I said before, around 8 to 15%. 
Now that's for uh, same language captioning. Uh, for translation, uh, that's a much more difficult to measure. Um, and that tends to increase the error even more because you are you have the error rate that's happening within the English, let's say, when someone's speaking English. If there's an error in the English, that of course will be an error in translation. And sometimes other things are just lost in translation. They don't translate well, perhaps, and so you'll have an error there as well. So the error rate tends to be higher when you're crossing uh, language boundaries. Uh, what we found, though, is that people adapt pretty readily uh, to this technology. Thanks, Will. That's really interesting, really, really interesting. I'd like now to bring our panel of teachers who are going to fire off questions to you right now. Um, and our first question comes from Sharon. Thanks, Troy. Thanks, Will. That's amazing. I'm Sharon Lehman. I'm a teacher with TAFE and I teach other teachers and I'm also a learning technologist. Teachers are always asking me how effective it is, which you've really answered so well, but how about effective is it with an accent? We have a lot of yeah. teachers with accents, please. Uh, great question. Uh, so I talked a little bit about accuracy overall, uh, but I didn't kind of break it down uh, with different, like different accents, uh, different ways of talking. Uh, and that will vary. I mean, I, I, I have to be honest, uh, uh, different accents will produce different quality. Uh, one of the things we've been working on is to uh, make it work as broadly as possible uh, and supporting uh, different accents. Uh, so we're doing this in two ways. Uh, we're uh, continually uh, updating and training uh, the generic model that I kind of used in this presentation, but we're also making uh, region specific models as well. And what I mean there is that you'll have uh, speech recognition for let's say uh, in Australia. So you have the Aussie dialect generally supported. So we actually have uh, plans to release updates that support uh, regional dialects. Uh, it won't be every region in the world, but we're going to where our plan is to support uh, a variety of uh, regions, major regions within the world. Hello, everyone. My name is Amy. It's been fantastic to hear what you've all been talking about, but I just wanted to have a think about this in, and, and ask you will in a different way. I work with a group of students. I lead a team of teachers and um, school support officers to work with our deaf and hard of hearing students. We use sign language in the classroom with our students, but I'm finding that I'd like the students to be part of group work with other students without having to have the, the sign language interpreter jumping in all the time. So how effective would it be to place an iPad on the table with the translator app up and running where the, all the students are using the one device so that they're connecting with each other rather than trying to connect through a laptop and we're, we're still developing that social connection between everybody. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, one of the real upsides I think of this technology is kind of the self empowerment of it. Uh, uh, as someone who's deaf or hard of hearing, for instance, can show up with their own device and then use it to help like caption audio that's in the environment. Um, how to use it in a, in a group setting, I think gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, if it's one student, I think it's relatively easy. The device could be placed in front of that student, for instance, and try to capture the, the audio in the environment. Uh, if you have multiple students, uh, the real problem is how are they going to see the captions? How are they going to re uh, read those captions if it's on one central device? Um, so what we tend to recommend in those kinds of scenarios where you want to support group work is some sort of multi-device kind of engagement where you have uh, a, a couple of devices or maybe several devices that are being used and then people talk into those devices. Uh, that doesn't mean, I mean, what what happens, what we tend to find with that is that people get accustomed to it. All of a sudden their, their behavior changes it a little bit at first, they have a hard time adapting to it, but then they get used to it. And then they, you know, then they just start talking to the device as what they do there. Uh, and then what happens is everyone else is joining that conversation and gets captions of what's being talked about. Um, it's possible also you could, uh, like if you have a microphone, uh, uh, and I've seen classrooms with this where there's a microphone that gets passed around. So uh, a microphone that's uh, maybe even streams the audio to hearing aids or cochlear implants, 
And that microphone's already being passed around because you want to be able to stream the audio from the student questions to the hearing aids and cochlear implants as well. And so what you can do then is if you're able to capture that audio from that device, maybe that's going to some central location, then you can caption that as well. So then the students can see the captions on their local devices. Awesome. Our next question comes from Adrian. Hello, my name is Adrian. I'm an assistant principal and my school is a very multicultural school. Uh, my question is, do you have any tips to improve the transla translation accuracy without using a wireless mic? Will adjusting your pace or the distance to the microphone make a difference? I just noticed that uh, the words and the phrase corrections at the end of the uh, at the end of each sentence. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so, uh, a, a lot of it is if 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 you can have a mic close to the mouth, it tends to improve the quality. But the underlying speech recognition, we're working on supporting a variety of scenarios. And so, uh, a lot of times when I'm using speech recognition in meetings, uh, I'm using uh, the little microphone in my camera. As it turns out, I'm not using a headset uh, and it works really well. Uh, and one of the reasons it works really well is because there is another noise in the environment. So it's just captioning me. There's no other signal that's coming in that's uh, that's going to confuse it. Uh, so uh, if you have a controlled environment where it's not particularly noisy, I will do well even with the microphone that's in the computer. But you will always improve quality if you can get to the microphone closer to the person who's talking. That's just an invariant aspect of speech recognition that really hasn't changed for years. The closer the mic is to the person talking, the better it does. Um, so I, I recommend that if at all possible, it could be a headset like what I'm wearing where I have something that is close talking like this. It can be a handheld mic where I'm holding a mic below me. It could be a lapel mic. Uh, it could be you know a, a variety of other devices that I can wear. Uh, I tend not to like the mics uh, that are used for remote meetings if this is an in-person meeting uh, that cover both ears because then you are basically uh, affecting your, your ability to interact then. You won't hear someone who's talking. You'll just hear yourself. Uh, so this mic, the reason I like this is because it's it's going over my head, and then I have a, just this little wand that sticks down close to my mouth. Uh, but there are a large variety of these devices out there, uh, and we tend to do pretty well across the variety of them. Thanks, Will. Uh, I'm Tom Hartley here. Um, I'm a digital technologies teacher. Um, our campus is prep to nine, and um, I'm currently yeah. In, uh, rolling out the digital technologies curriculum and I just had a question um, around this translator. Have you got any recommendations of any Python um, libraries or any coding examples that you might be able to share? Yeah, uh, great question. A very technical question, uh, but I do have an answer for you. Uh, so um, uh, the Microsoft Translator, and I think I kind of mentioned this in one uh, in part of my presentation, underlyingly uh, it's using an API uh, that you can call. So uh, our apps call it the different uh, tools, like if it's integrated into different tools, like even in PowerPoint, they call uh, that underlying API to do uh, speech recognition and translation. That is available externally. So someone can develop tools over the, uh, uh, our infrastructure, develop their own tools. And so we have code examples. Uh, I'm gonna pull this up. So uh, we have a GitHub uh, repository. Uh, that has a whole bunch of uh, example uh, translator uh, tools with source code that you can uh, use or modify uh, to support a variety of things. So if you have students that want to work with Microsoft Translator themselves, maybe they want to develop some tool that does translation, they can look at the code samples here and then it will uh, give them ideas about what to do and how to do it. Um, so the and we have them across a bunch of different languages, uh, different tools. Uh, Document Translator is just translating like Word documents or PDFs. Uh, so you can take this and modify it and translate a variety of documents. But then there are all sorts of other kinds of uh, example code uh, snippets. And Python is an example here for text translation, how you can do uh, text translation in, in Python. And this is some sample code uh, that gives you some examples about how to uh, uh, do a translation session in Python. Now this is mostly focused on text translation. I don't know that we have any that are speech translation focused. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. Um, uh, 
it's uh, it's using the same underlying uh, API, uh, and so uh, what I showed you using the Microsoft Translator apps that multi-device functionality is actually represented within the API set, and there's documentation on that. I don't have the screen for that, but uh, it taught you can create a session or you can join a session from your own tool. So just like we did with OneNote, we integrated that in using that API. Someone could do that with your with their own tool if they wanted to basically, okay, I'm going to do something that's integrated into my Blackboard, let's say, that does this multi-device conversation thing. And maybe you have a student that's really adept at this kind of coding. That's something that they could, in fact, do. Thanks, Will. That's amazing. And I know there's going to be a lot of teachers that are going to be listening to this and watching this and thinking, wow, there's so much I can do with this tool for EAL students, for hard of hearing students, and even you know mainstream students as well. So thanks very much for being a part of this. You're quite welcome. It was a lot of fun and hope to see you again soon. I'll be showing the newly updated and improved PowerPoint Presenter Coach. Presenter Coach uses AI to listen and now watch how you present and give you feedback. So let's get started. I'm here in PowerPoint for the web and I'll go to the slideshow tab and you'll see this Rehearse with Coach. Rehearse with Coach has already been here for a little while, Presenter Coach in PowerPoint, but there are some new enhancements that I'll be showing in addition to the original ones. If I drop the arrow down, you'll see Show Body Language Feedback. I'm gonna check this on and we'll show some of the new features in Presenter Coach. Now I click Rehearse with Coach. Here's the pop-up, it says, welcome to PowerPoint Presenter Coach. You'll rehearse and then at the end, you'll get a nice little numerical summary and some suggestions. Click Start Rehearsing. Now you'll see there's video as well as the original audio. So the video part is new and PowerPoint's going to watch as I present. Some of the body language critiques. The first one could be, maybe I've gotten a little bit too close. Oh, move farther away from the screen. Hey, that's the spot. Could be I'm too far back. Whoa, I didn't realize I was so far back. Hey, move a little closer. Perfect. Another critique is maybe I'm inadvertently putting my hand in front of my face and, oh, keep the area in front of your face clear, okay? Another one is I might be looking in a different direction. Oh, oh, face the camera. Engage with your audience. Okay, those are some of those new body language critiques that have just rolled out to PowerPoint in the web. We still have the audio as well. And you can note, maybe I don't want to have the video showing the entire time. I could say, stop seeing your camera. Now my camera is hidden. I could also say, turn off the real-time feedback. I check that bell there and you can see now it's turned off. We'll turn on the real-time feedback for audio, but maybe I want to leave the video part off. Let's go to the next slide. Now some of the existing critiques I will show for those of you that are newer to this. One is PowerPoint checks the speed at which you're talking. So I'm gonna start talking really fast. We have five planets on the screen. It's Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Try speaking a bit slower. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Inclusive language is also something that PowerPoint can listen for. For example, hey you guys, did you know that Mars is the red planet? Sensitive phrases. This might be offensive or non-inclusive in some cases. Another thing PowerPoint can do is listen to see if you're reading from the slides. When the satellite approached Jupiter, it discovered a few rings around Jupiter as well as volcanic activity on the moon. Try to avoid reading the slides. Summarize your key points. Presenter Coach can also listen for the tone of your voice. I call this the Bueller test for Ferris Bueller's teacher. This planet has rings surrounding it. What is the name of the planet with rings? Anyone? Anyone? Try varying your pitch and adding emphasis to key words. Okay. The other thing that Presenter Coach will check for, and hey, good job with my pitch variation. Keep it up. The other thing is that I can check for filler words. So PowerPoint will listen if I do, for example. And um, Uranus is a... Uh, try not to use too many fillers. Lastly, PowerPoint can listen if you're using the same word repeatedly. Here's some examples. A really awesome planet is Neptune. And it's so awesome that I'm gonna tell you why. Because of all the awesomeness of the universe, Neptune is the most awesome of all the awesome planets. So I said awesome a whole lot of times there, my favorite adjective. When we get to the final report, we'll show you what that looks like. 
Now when I'm done, I will hit the escape key. Here's my report, my rehearsal report. My pacing was pretty good. You can see when I sped up a lot right there, there's my little peak, my different pitch. And you can see that I had my monotone test with the Bueller pitch. Now body language right here is new. Eye contact, if I expand this, it actually took photos when I was facing away and when I was looking forwards. Clear view when I had my hand on my head and when I didn't have my hand over my forehead. And lastly, distance. Expand that, oh, that's where I was too close and that's where I was backing up. Some other aspects, fillers, to sound more polished, don't say um as much. Repetitive language, try to use synonyms, don't say awesome so many times. Looks like I said okay too many times as well. And sensitive phrases, instead of you guys, consider saying you instead, which is more inclusive language. So PowerPoint gives you this great report and really gives you suggestions on how to improve. Now, if you're an educator, what a great thing to do is have your students do a screenshot. I'll do window shift S, say, I'd like you to screenshot your rehearsal report like this, let go, and then paste it into an email so you can show that you were practicing. PowerPoint will continue to add improvements and refinements to presenter coach. So keep up and watch what gets added in the near future. Okay, so that's it for today. I hope you had a really good time. I hope you also learned a whole lot. I know there's some really amazing applications for this tool. Wanting to catch up on some of our other webinars, then you can click on this link right here and you can be taken to my YouTube page, which has got all our recordings from past webinars. Thanks very much for being a part of this and I hope you have a great day.